Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast, episode 14 of History 101, Egypt, the Old Kingdom of Awesome. We left off talking about geography and the Nile, how the deserts protected Egypt and the Nile from the Delta to the First Cataract, created Egypt, quote-unquote. But really, to get Egypt, you had to unite the Nile from the Delta to the Cataract. And from around 3000 or so BC, BCE to 2700 BCE, Egypt was broken into two kingdoms, an upper kingdom and a lower kingdom. Upper Egypt in the south and lower Egypt in the north. Remember, upper and lower, are talk, they're talking about the Nile. So when they think about it, when they're thinking about it, upper Egypt is higher because remember, water always rolls downhill. So upper Egypt, southern Egypt is literally higher than lower Egypt is. Well, around 2700 BC, we get the Old Kingdom. The conquest of the Nile, we get unity, we get Egypt. We get a kingdom that goes from the Delta to the First Cataract. We get the first nation state. We get a place that you could call Egypt that has a clear culture, wealth, unity, law, trade, weights, measures. It's unified. It has a beginning and an end. It's the deserts on the side, the sea in the north, and the first cataract in the south. And the old kingdom is successful. It lasts 500 or so years. It's also stable. There are only three dynasties that make up the old kingdom. That's long. That's 100 and what, 50, 175 years a dynasty on average, right? The dynasties of the first intermediate period, there were four, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, there's five. There's five dynasties in the first intermediate period. That's 100 years. That's five dynasties in about 20 years each versus three dynasties in the old kingdom of 175 years each. So it's stable. That stability was based upon no invasions because of the deserts. You have peace. There are no armies. The old kingdom does not have an army, which means it doesn't have to spend money on an army. So Pharaoh is going to have money. He also gets credited with peace. It's a godlike ability. Peace is godlike to be able to create peace, right? It's in the Beatitudes, right? Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers. That's a godlike ability. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Four, prosperity. So it's successful. It's stable. It's not getting invaded. So the the king gets credit for this. There's no armies. And then four, it's prosperous. The Nile floods. You get the harvest, which means you make money. Another godlike ability. Prosperity. There but for the grace of God go I, right? I mean, if you want to win the lottery, what do you do? You pray to a god. You'll pray to animals. You pray to a spirit that's bigger than you. It's a godlike ability to be prosperous. And so life is good, stable, peaceful, and Pharaoh has godlike abilities of prosperity and stability. We haven't talked about legitimacy, though. How are you going to get legitimacy? The Nile floods. You're not getting invaded. Things are good. Life is fine. You don't need to build walls. You don't need to fight nomads. 
where's your legitimacy going to come from? You don't even have Hammurabi's problem of giant cities with lots of diversity that uh, no one knows what the culture is or no one knows what the rules are. The rules are the Pharaoh's rules. The culture is Egyptian culture. So why do we need a Pharaoh? Why do we... How, how do you get legitimacy when everything is good? When everything is awesome? The answer is... Why do we need a pharaoh when life is good? And what can a pharaoh do for us? And the answer is pyramids, 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 pyramids. The old kingdom is the kingdom that builds the pyramids. No other kingdom really does. I mean, you get a couple who are like, hey, let's bring the band back together and make a pyramid. But they're they're not really serious or very long lasting you know yeah let's go on tour again uh, yeah okay it's the old kingdom it's the original so pyramids pyramids are going to create legitimacy why why are pyramids going to make legitimacy that's kind of crazy except it's really not and I'll explain it one, Pharaoh has money. Remember, Pharaoh is Pharaoh. Now, Pharaoh can be a man or a woman. That's It's important to understand. Pharaoh has godlike abilities and is in charge of government. But remember, Pharaoh does not lead armies. So Pharaoh does not have to be a man. Pharaoh has to make sure that things are stable and the Nile floods. A woman can do that. You have to talk to the gods. A man or a woman can do that because the gods are men and women, right? It's pretty easy. So now what's interesting is when a woman is Pharaoh, it's rare, but it happens and it, no one like bats an eye at it. When the f female ruler wants to do pharaoh stuff she wears the headdress and a fake beard but in truth most of the even the men wore a fake beard and a headdress because they the, the egyptians actually shaved off all of their hair because they lived in the desert so you won't want sand and bugs and lice and in all, all that so you sh the, the the egyptians are immensely clean people in the ancient world they had a giant river. And so the, the funny thing is that both male and female pharaohs cosplayed as a god, as a pharaoh god, to talk to the gods. And since both were cosplaying, both and wore the same outfit, both sexes could be pharaoh. And the Egyptians were like, yeah, that's cool. Whereas in Mesopotamia or in nomadic societies, it really had to be a man because a man had to lead the armies. A man had to do hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Do you get female rulers from time to time? Yeah, you do. But they're the exception. In Egypt, they're still an exception, but they're not a... They're an unexceptional exception, if, that, if you know what I mean. Like, it's fine that it happened. So let's go back to this. Why the pyramids create legitimacy? Well, Pharaoh has money, right? He's not building armies. He's Pharaoh. And he, want, and he wants to be liked. He needs legitimacy. The Nile floods for three months every year, which means the people have time. Everything is 10 feet underwater. All the farmland is 10 feet underwater. So you're just sitting there playing Xbox, playing Fortnite, playing Madden, and having a great old time, eating Cheetos, you know, life is great. You don't have to work, because remember, you're making 300% in the nine months. You got a three-month vacation. There has never been a time in human history since the beginning of civilization that is so 
economically efficient in one's use of time. There's just no other time where the mass amount of people gained more for their work. Now, we look at them and we would look at the modern money and say, oh, these people were immensely poor compared to all the crap I've got and all the money I have. But you can't look at it compared to like post, especially post-industrialization, where you get inventions and then they get cheaper over time. So life is good. You have to look at it and relative to, to the time period. So Pharaoh has money and he wants to be liked. The Nile floods and people have time. Ha ha. And so let's build a giant building only useful when I'm dead. That's what we're going to do. Plus, we're not going to use any slaves. No slaves. So we have to take a little sidebar here because slaves did not build the pyramids, nor did the Hebrews slash Jews. One, slaves do not like being slaves. So the whole point of building a pyramid to gain legitimacy, i.e. people will like you, would be negated by using slaves. Two, the Hebrews did not build the pyramids. Now, first thing is, Book of Exodus does not say the Hebrews build the pyramids. They made brick. Two, so already there, this is a misnomer of a story. Even the Old Testament story does not say the Hebrews, the, even the Old Testament story knows better than to say that. Two, the Hebrews don't really exist in 2500 BC as Hebrews, as a separate Canaanite people yet. They're certainly not monotheist this this far back. You know, pre this is still a thousand years before Babylon. So there is no historical record of this at all. So why do people think this? And it's basically because of 19th century Protestant Sunday school teachers. Because Sunday school teachers are nice people. They're nice. And in the 19th century, they're mostly women. Okay? They're moms. And they want to teach a moral philosophy to their children. To the children of the town. And so they want to teach them the Bible. Because they're a Sunday school teacher. And that's great. Nothing wrong with that. And so they're going to teach them. Moses, because you have to teach Moses. It's awesome. Kit the plagues, the frogs, the locusts, the blood in the river. I mean, you the parting of the. I mean, if you're going to make a movie of the Bible, yeah, make a movie on Moses. It's a great story. Okay, so we got the Bible Exodus story. It takes place in Egypt. Well, in the 19th century, when archaeology is just kind of starting to become a science, what do the basic ordinary person say, a school marm in Brighton or Leeds or York know about ancient Egypt? And the answer is nothing. So she knows two things. The Bible says Hebrews were slaves there and Egypt has pyramids. That's it. That's all you got. Egypt has pyramids because everybody knows Egypt has pyramids because they're, the, you know, one of the great wonders of the world. And they know what the Bible tells them, which is the Hebrews were slaves there. You add to it 19th century rich people's attitudes towards work, which was you don't do it. Rich people don't work. A gentleman, by definition, did not work, did not have a job. They lived off the interests of their land or their investments. 
a lady does not work. So this whole idea of the Protestant work ethic that rich people work harder than poor people is BS. It has always been BS. A hundred years ago, rich people do not work more than poor people. They work less because the first thing you do when you make a lot of money is work less. Because you don't have to work as much. So they, in the 19th century, in an age that still was the dying ages of slavery, the 1830s, slavery still existing in, in America. It's dying out in the Anglo world. It's still in Brazil. It will be in Brazil for another 50 years. It will be in America for another 30 years. So if you're talking 1835, you're in a world where slaves do the work for rich people. And you look at the pyramids and you go, that looks like a lot of work. And it's in the sun and it's in the sand. And you go, I wouldn't want to do that. I'm a gentleman. I don't. No, 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 no. I want to. I want to read poetry. I want to write about the hills of England. I do not want to do that work. And so the idea was slaves must have built it. The Hebrews were slaves. So thus the Hebrews built the pyramids. Done. It turns out it's not true in any way, shape, or form. And this is the problem when people say, oh, the Bible is literal. It's not. It's not even close. It was never meant to be. It was It was never supposed to be. It's a, The Bible is a morality tale. Really about one's relationship with Yahweh, with God, especially the Old Testament. You know. Even even the book of Exodus is written a thousand years after the events are supposed to have taken place. How accurate could it possibly be? And so 19th century school, Sunday school teachers who don't know anything about Egypt, don't know anything about Egyptology, are making these stories up and they become part of the culture. But they also have all their own biases. And there's a racism in it too. The Egyptians could not build something as awesome as the pyramids. Give me a freaking break. They're brown people. And today they're Muslims. This is what they would have said in 1840. No way. They're backwards. They're poor. No, no, no. At least the Hebrews are, you know, they're Jewish, but they're white. Because remember, there's still European anti-Semitism in this. So there's always a kind of wink of, oh, you know. They're kind of, you know. We built the Suez Canal, you know, but the Egyptians, please. So there's a racism in it. So when when the movie came out a couple years ago, gods and idols or whatever it was, gods and pharaohs, whatever it was, gods and kings, that's supposed to be Moses and it's supposed to be the Exodus story. And they're building the pyramids. I like I saw the trailer and I like my mind melted and I went to my wife and I'm like, they're not building the pyramids, are they? They're not building the pyramids, are they? My wife's like, they're building the pyramids. I'm like, oh my God. Because it's like, first, there's the racism. The idea that the Egyptians couldn't build their own pyramids is freaking racist, man. Of course they built their own pyramids. And it's just not historical. It's not. It's just not right in any way, shape, or form. It's not right in the time period. It's not right in the culture. It's not right in the literature. It's just not right. And it's insulting. So I spent a little time on this because it's important that you don't perpetuate these lies that are no one meant to do it. No one meant they were just based on biases. And that's what this class is trying to get to. Perspectives. It's trying to get you to think about things. Could this really have happened? What really did happen? How and why is it important? Because what these 19th century Protestant school, Sunday school teachers were doing were imposing their own biases against work and against brown people on their attitude of their story. And that story got spread and became the story, history. So that movies are still perpetuating it. Still. We're in 2021 and we're still perpetuating this. 
So they don't use slaves. It would have been pointless to use slaves. First of all, there are no slaves. You can't invade. the. the there's no army to invade other people. There are no slaves in Egypt, in the old kingdom, when we're building pyramids. So the pharaoh wants legitimacy. He wants Egyptians to like him. So what does he do? He pays well. Remember, these people are making 300, they're making $150,000 a year, working nine months. Now Pharaoh is going, hey guys, come work for me out in the desert, because remember, the everything's 10 feet underwater, so we're going to have to build the pyramids in a place the floods don't go, otherwise it would, you can't do the work and they would destroy a pyramid, it would, you know, subsume, you can't build a pyramid that's going to stand forever a muck. It has to be built on solid land. So if he's going to get them to, to go out into the desert to do this, he's got to pay well. He's got to give them an incentive. So he pays them well. He's got to provide entertainment. Now, entertainment in the, in the ancient world usually means gambling and prostitutes, just so you know. When you see entertainment, it's usually gambling and prostitutes. So the Pharaoh is not only giving them money, he's also spawning them some money and giving them access to fun stuff. Yeah, and there might be, you know, musical treats and and it has got to be good food. There has to be good sanitation, right? He's also providing masculine, prideful work. You're going to lift stone. You're going to move blocks. You're going to build something. How do the women and the wives feel about this? When their husband comes back, or their boyfriend, comes back from the desert three months later, working eight to ten hours a day, maybe more, in the sun. So he's working, let's say, ten hours a day. In the sun, doing physical manual labor with money in his pocket because he hasn't really had too much to spend money on. What do you think? What do you think the women and the wives think about these guys when they come home? And what do they think about Pharaoh sending them back like that? The answer is they love it. Why? Because these guys are going to be jacked. They're going to do three months of heavy manual labor. They're going to be ripped. They're going to be toned. They are going to be tan because they're out in the sun. Woohoo! And they got money in their pocket to spend on their wives, their girlfriends, their kids. And why? Because of Pharaoh. So this is a success. It's easily a success. These also take decades to build. There's few tools. So you need people to come back every year. The fact that there are pyramids, the fact that there are more than one shows that pharaohs had legitimacy because people have to like pharaoh to keep coming back year after year after year after year. If they didn't like pharaoh, they would stay home with their money. So the people like pharaoh, the pyramids are going up, pharaoh is fine, Egypt is fine. Everything is great. Pharaoh gets a rep. Remember, Pharaoh's spending money on entertainment. He's spending money on good food, good sanitation. He's got people has to like it. They have to come back year after year. So can Pharaoh be cheap? No. If you're watching the videos, we have our, our tips, right? We got one tip where the price is $3,000 for the, for the um, bill. And the tip is $10,000. Like if you're Beyonce, that's your tip, right? If you're Kim Kardashian, that's your tip. $3,000, I'm going to give you 300%. Boom. $10,000 tip. Nice. Thank you. Or here's $30.92. And the tip is shruggy. Ha, <laughs> sucks to be you. Can Pharaoh do that? Can Pharaoh be cheap? No. The entertainment can't be bad. The food, the entertainment, the medicine, the sewage infrastructure, none of it can be bad. It all costs money. Pharaoh has money, but it costs money and you have to have it up front. There is no credit on this. 
You have to have this cash. You have to be able to pay the people. Also, (laughs) size matters. Gentlemen, don't let anyone tell you the size of your pyramid doesn't matter because it matters. Because you will be judged on the size of your pyramid. You want, when someone sees your pyramid for the first time, think about it. Think about what you want their reaction to be. Do you want their reaction to be, oh my God, this is amazing. It's it's ginormous. It's, whoa, wow, ha, huh, whoo, I just can't believe such a thing exists. Or do you want their reaction to be, oh, that's cute. It's so, it's so little. It's so, it's it's just cute. I want to put it like in my bag and take it with me places. Oh, it's so cute. Oh, oh I love it. I love it. It's so, it's so little and cute. Which one? Which one, gentlemen? Which one? Yeah. The first one. Why? Remember this class, we're always asking why. Why? Why does size matter? Because the size doesn't matter. Only one dude is going to be buried in the pyramid. You don't need it to be big. It's pointless to be big. But it's not the size. It's not the utilitarianism that matters. It's not what it's used for. It's what the size represents. Which is why when I ask you, do you want people... To say your pyramid is enormous or tiny, you say enormous. Not because it matters in its utility, but in its representation. The bigger it is, the better it is. Why? Because the better the king had to be. A great king builds great pyramids. For example, Khufu. Khufu will build the biggest pyramid. In Egypt. Now, you know nothing about Khufu. I know nothing about Khufu. So what do you think about Khufu? All I'm going to tell you is he built the biggest pyramid in Egypt. So did he suck as a king or was he awesome? The answer is he's awesome. He has to be awesome. Why? Because it's bigger. So more people had to work on it. A typical estimate is about 100,000 people a year. Now, that number has been revised down, but I like it as 100,000. You're going to build a giant pyramid. You're not doing it with 5,000 people a year. So 100,000 people a year. It requires more resources, literally more stone. You literally have to mine more stone. You have to, you need more food for more people, right? You need more entertainment. You need more of everything. Khufu's pyramid is 485 feet high. The tallest thing ever built in Mesopotamia. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Which are a thousand years later. 1500 years later. No, wait. Hanging Gardens is Nebuchadnezzar. So we're talking 2000 years later. Right? Is only 75 feet. The Great Pyramid at Giza. Khufu's pyramid is seven times the highest thing ever built in the ancient world. You also have to be king longer. You can't build the great pyramid of Khufu in a year, in a two. It took 20 years. Kids who were born when Khufu started building his pyramid were working on that pyramid with their dads by the time it was over. And there's also... If you're going to build a giant pyramid and you're going to make yourself important, you have to be bigger than your dad's. So the size matters. You always have to be bigger. Because it has to represent, you're representing. So what's the advantage of the pyramids? They touch everybody. Everybody gets money out of this. Everybody gets something out of it. You have so many people coming every year. That are going to walk away with money in their pockets. And they're ripped. And they got six pack abs. Pharaoh looks good. They're like, everybody's like, hey, Pharaoh. That was great entertainment. I did great work. When you see your wife, your wife's like, oh my God, look at how awesome you look. And you're like, cha-ching. Let's go buy a Maserati. And you're like, that's great. 
There's nothing else like this in the world. Nothing. The Great Wall in China is going to be built by slaves when we talk about it. Or what the Qin Empire emperor will build will be built by slaves. There's nothing in Mesopotamia anywhere close to this. There's nothing that is so part of the culture that touches so many people. The closest things are the sacrifices for the gods. Closest thing. Because that's, remember, that's community. This is national. People from all over Egypt are coming together for this. The disadvantages, and they're, they're going to be important disadvantages, is money. Money, money, money. There is nothing you are going to have to spend more money on as a pharaoh than your pyramid. And there's limits to how much money you can spend. But remember, the size matters. And you're always trying to build a bigger pyramid. So you need to get more money to build a bigger pyramid. But there are limits to how much money even Egypt has. The other thing is they require time and attention. Imagine you start building your pyramid and it falls down. Isn't that embarrassing? Are people going to say, oh, Pharaoh with the falling down uh, pyramid, with the limp pyramid. Boy, that Pharaoh's impressive. Are they going to say that? No. You want your pyramid to stand up tall for a long time. To reach for the sky. You don't want falling down. That's embarrassing. So if you're going to do something right, you have to do it yourself. It requires time and attention. The problem is, and why is this a disadvantage? Because Pharaoh is not pyramid builder in chief. Pharaoh is Pharaoh. Pharaoh is supposed to be a government official who's hanging out with gods, making sure things are stable and life is prosperous. The pyramids are a side gig. They're a side hustle. But increasingly, as the pyramids get bigger, they become the job. And that's going to be a problem. Why? Because the old kingdom will decline. Why? Well, the pyramids, actually, as funny as it is. How? Well, the pyramids are the most important thing a pharaoh will do in their life. They will be judged by the awesomeness of their, of their pyramid, right? So they require the pharaoh's attention. But other government stuff needs to get done. Roads. Uh, regulations. Um, you need to solve some tax collector stole money. You got you got um, uh, the karate class lets out early and all the kids chop down, you know, karate chop uh, people's fences. Like people are going to call up 1-800-PHARAOH and be like, yo, Pharaoh, can you help get stuff done? Can you fix things? Now, a great Pharaoh says, of course I can. Khufu could build the greatest pyramid in the world and handle people's karate kid class fence chopping. But how many Hall of Fame pharaohs are there? And the answer is, not a lot. We're going to see this over and over again in everything. For every Cyrus, you get a Cambyses. For every... Octavian, you get a Tiberius or a Caligula. Well, you, uh, no, I can't say for every Octavian. You get a good Octavian. You get, you know, Claudius. Not bad, but not great. You know, how many Tom Brady's are out there? Two, three. And you can make the argument, Tom Brady, there is only one Tom Brady, but how many Hall of Fame quarterbacks are playing right now? There's 32 teams in the NFL. How many? How many, uh, you know, Hall of Fame, first ballot Hall of Famers are playing basketball as point guards or shooting guards right now? How many? There's 30 teams. Do each of them have a Hall of Famer? No. There's three, four, five. Right? There's a couple. But most people are ordinary. They're not bad, but they're not great. And there's some people who are terrible at the job. And so 
no matter who you are, you need to build your pyramid and government stuff needs to get done. And what happens is pharaohs start to turn to their, their homeboys, the nobility. And they start to turn and go, hey, 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 homeboy, can you help me out? I got to deal with my pyramid and there's a karate class in your neighborhood that's destroying fences. Can you take care of it? And the nobility says, of course, no problem. Is the nobility going to ask for money? No, no. You're my homeboy. I'm going to pay you, please. It's you're you're lucky I called you up, homeboy. No, 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 no. That said, or is the nobility going to fix the fences themselves? No, of course not. They're the nobility. They don't fix fences. They hire people to fix fences. And so what they do is they go to Pharaoh and they say, great, I am going to take care of this, but I need a bigger budget. I need no money. Don't pay me. I, I am a I am your homeboy. I am doing I am helping you out. I am happy to do so. But I need to hire people. And the Pharaoh says, Of course you should have a budget. You gotta hire people. You're not gonna do the work. I need the work to get done. Are you gonna take care of it? The nobility says, Of course, but I need some money to make sure it gets taken care of. And the Pharaoh says, Sure, great. Peels off some money. Boom, there you go. And so what happens is the nobility step in, start helping people, and start running local government. So you stop calling 1-800-Pharaoh. And you start calling 1-800-Noble-Dude. And even if you call 1-800-Pharaoh, it's press 1 for the listing of your nearest noble dude to help you out. Pharaoh doesn't care. Pharaoh is Hey, is is after Khufu, Pharaoh is worried about pyramid building and l- less about governing. Which means what happens to legitimacy? Legitimacy starts to move to the nobility because the nobility are getting things done and Pharaoh is less important. And you say, well, wait a minute. What about pyramids? Well, the pyramids get smaller because there's less money. Remember when Khufu was doing both jobs at the same time? He had all the money. Now, Pharaoh is concentrating on one job, pyramid building, and so he's giving money to, for people to do the other job, which means every dollar he gives to a noble person to hire someone else to fix the problem is a dollar less he has for his pyramid. So less money equals less people to hire. So you're not hiring 100,000 people. You're hiring 50,000, 30,000, 20,000, 5,000. You're not buying as much stone. Like you physically can't buy as much stone because you can't afford it. Three, food, entertainment, all the stuff that you need in order to have people in a place for a long period of time to do a job, you have less money for. And remember, Pharaoh can't be cheap. Remember, you still want people to like you. And so it's less people. It's less. You're still going doing good food, but there's less of it, right? There's there's one good meal a day instead of three meals. It's, yeah, people will grouse. Maybe the food does get a little worse, as, as especially towards the end. And less people start coming back. So what happens is legitimacy fades away. And it transfers to the nobility who are solving people's problems. See the obelisks. So what happens is the nobility starts building their own cool stuff. Why? Well, legitimacy is seen in building big things. But you can't build your own pyramid. Pharaohs get a pyramid. You build a pyramid. You're saying to Pharaoh, I'm like you. And you want to lose your head. You tell Pharaoh you're like him. Pharaohs, no king like somebody else walking around being like, I'm just like the king. No, 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 no. You have to be something else. And so what they picked was this obelisk. It's tall. It can be seen around. And the most important part is it has four flat sides. And on those four flat sides, you can tell a story 
of your awesomeness. So that when someone walks up, boop, 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 they take a look at the obelisk, they read, here in this town is the nobleman Awesome Sauce, who saves babies from crocodiles and uh, has a festival of sweet corn and I don't know he does cool things he's you know nobleman awesome sauce and so they read this and go whoa this nobleman's got to be pretty cool and they'll go to him to buy and sell goods or to buy their goods if they're a wandering merchant or if there's some up and comer they won't go to the pharaoh for a job they'll go to the noble guy and go hey I saw your obelisk and meanwhile Pharaoh after Pharaoh after Pharaoh, the pyramids get smaller. Less and less people are engaged in it. And so what happens is the last Pharaoh dies and nobody cares. The old kingdom fades away. No one killed it. It didn't die in blood and death like the Assyrian Empire. It wasn't murdered like the enemies of or the or the or Darius's homeboys who got in his way. No, nobody wanted to destroy the old kingdom. Nobody wanted to take over. It was it just died. It died a long, old death. And people moved on. Nobody cared because the government job was no longer being done by Pharaoh. So when he died, there wasn't a vacuum. So this brings us to the first intermediate period, which ironically, for a thing that just faded away, initiates 100 years of noble warfare. And you go, wait a minute, Professor, you just said it faded away. Well, yeah, but remember, Pharaoh is the greatest job humanity has ever invented. It is by far the greatest job humans have ever come up with. Alexander had four jobs. He loved pharaoh of egypt way better than the other ones you get to be a god of the richest place on earth for keeping the peace in the middle of a desert and making the river floods that floods every year it is the greatest job ever and what happens is years go by and a bunch of noble guys look around and they go hey there's no pharaoh you know what I would like to be? You know what would be cool? If I became Pharaoh. And if one person starts to say it, somebody else starts to say it. And what happens is, when one Pharaoh, one guy says, hey, I'm going to be Pharaoh, a bunch of other people say, oh, no, you're not. I'm going to be Pharaoh. And so that brings on the war. It's not that the Pharaoh was doing a job doing a job that people were going to murder each other over. It was, it's a great job to have if you can get it. And so why wouldn't you want it? No one else has it. And so you get a hundred years of warfare and who wins the princes of Thebes all the way in the South, in the tip, tip, tip of upper Egypt, where the first cataract is. And you would go, wait a minute, professor. That makes no sense. It should be the Delta guys who win. And I would say, yes, there are more people in the, in the North, in the Delta. Yes. There's more money in the Delta. Yes. But you know what there wasn't? African trade and African mercenaries. The princes of Thebes, by being at the first cataract, were the town where African trade met Egypt. So they, they had a financial advantage because they were able to bring in African goods that they could then sell along. And remember, you have to understand taxes in the ancient world. The number one income, the number one tax is sales tax. When we talk taxes in the ancient world, we're talking sales taxes because they're easy to collect. Merchants need a place to sell their goods because people are always trying to steal from them. So you need a place that's safe. Governments say, I will give you this space and I will protect it. I will hire guards to protect it, but you got to pay me 10%. And the merchants say, of course, that's not a problem. 
Because what do they do to their prices? They jack them up 10%. Done. The people don't know they're paying for it because you just add it to the price. You don't have a separate tax. Like, you know America hates taxes because we do our sales tax separately from the good tax, from the good price. I want to buy an air conditioner. I have $100. It says $19.99 on the, on the, sale, on the uh, form. I'm going to take this. Here, charge me. I have my $99.99. I have my $99.99. And they go, it's $115. And you go, well, no, 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 no. It said $99.99. And then in America, we say plus tax. But in Sweden, in Scandinavia, in Germany, it's already added in. So when I see something for 1700 kroner, it is 1700 kroner. That's it. 500 Deutschmarks, it's 500 Deutschmarks. It's all the taxes already fit in. And that's the way most sales taxes in the history of the world, because people don't get upset about it. They go, okay, I'll pay it. No problem. Boom. So the people pay, pay the tax. The tax gets handed over to the government. Everybody's happy. So being in control of that, being in the place, and we're going to talk about Constantinople and we're going to talk about the Silk Road, being in the place where that happens, where you're able to turn wholesale into retail, kind of like Costco, is where you make money. And what the princes of Thebes do is they take that money and they hand it right back to those African merchants. And they say, hey, can you hire me some mercenaries? And the African merchants say, of course, I'm taking 10% of this as a finder's fee. And the prince of Thebes say, of course you are. Duh. And the point is, is that they turn a fiscal advantage into a military advantage. And in Africa, in the second, in Kush, in Nap Napata, kingdoms fight all the time. They have very good armies. Mercenary armies, small armies, just like in Mesopotamia. Little kingdoms are fighting all the time. So there's plenty of people who are like, work in Egypt? Versus people who don't know how to fight? Yeah! And so they turn their fiscal advantage, and we're going to see this a bunch of times in this class, into a military advantage. And that equals victory. The princes of Thebes marched their armies up, down the river, defeat their enemies. Upper Egypt, the south, runs Egypt. Now that's 900 miles from Thebes to the Delta. That's as long as Mesopotamia. So that's how big of a you know, place we're talking about. And they're going to create the Middle Kingdom. The princes of Thebes create the Middle Kingdom. They have conquered themselves the Middle Kingdom. Stability. Prosperity. Are they going to build pyramids? What about their African mercenary army? Are they going to keep them? They're expensive. All of those things we'll talk about in our next episode in the Middle Kingdom. So we built pyramids. We built legitimacy. We didn't use slaves. We saw Khufu. We know that size of our pyramid matters. And then we became so obsessed with our pyramids that we lost our empire. We lost our kingdom. It faded away right there in front of us. And now we're going to talk about the Middle Kingdom in our next episode. So be safe, take care, stay healthy. I know this was a long episode, but we talked about a lot of stuff. And be safe. Bye. And thank you.